Today is our last day in our series on the book of Esther. We've covered a lot of ground and we've learned a lot, right? We've learned that God is always working behind the scenes, even when we can't feel it, and even through the chaos and evils of this world. We also learned that our story has perfectly positioned us for the moment that God has called us to. There's providence in that. There's grace in that. There's hope in that. And Esther's been learning that on the fly. Right? It's easy for us to read the book and look back and be like, yeah, here are the obvious truths. But you know it's the case. When you're walking in your life and things are dark and you're confused and you don't hear God, it's anything but easy to be like faithful. <laughs> it's anything but easy to be, say, okay, God, this is all working out according to your plan and your purpose. She's living it in the moment and it is crazy. In fact, it's so hard for her to have faith in God that even when Mordecai all but threatens her to expose her, to have her killed under the same order, she still is kind of reserved and isn't sure if she's going to be able to step into the fullness of what God has planned for her. But it's time. Do you remember the end of last week? The end of the chapter, she says, okay, have everybody pray for me. Have everybody fast for me. And if I perish... I perish, right? I'll go before the king. If I die, I die. Well, you can say that. (laughs) But what happens when you actually have to step before the king and your neck is on the line? It's time. So we pick up the story in in Esther chapter 5 today. She's asked everybody to, to, to pray for her. It's the third day. She's dressed up. She walks before the king. And this is the moment. You could imagine, like, the inner king's court. If you go in here, and she's already told us, Last week, you don't go before the king unless he's asked you to come. Because all he's got to do is withhold that scepter and you're about to meet your maker. So she walks to those doors. Could you imagine that moment? You know, stomach in your, in your throat. <laughs> Can't quite swallow. Oh, God! She doesn't seem to be overtly religious in this moment, but it wouldn't surprise me if she's not offering up a little prayer like, oh, you know, I don't want to die. <laughs> Help me. Maybe you've done that even if you're not like super religious in all of your prayers. But when the moment comes and you're about to, you know, feel all the pressure, you're like, God, okay. No, we don't have an awesome conversation usually. I could really use your help in this moment. Do you know that God even answers those kinds of prayers just because he's good? (laughs) So the time happens. She opens the door, sticks her neck out on the line, and the king sees her. And luckily, it's not an off-with-her-head type moment. He extends the golden scepter. She comes in, and this is where we pick up the story. Because you've got to imagine that he's confused as to why she'd be coming. There's got to be a, a real reason, a big request for her to be sticking her neck out like that. So he literally says that. What do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? He's expecting a big ask, so he promises a big return. I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. Esther replied, here's what I want. If it please the king, which is all that we've been concerned with in the book of Esther so far, right? Not if it pleases God. Not if it makes sense for everybody else and the little guy. If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come to a banquet that I've prepared for the king. So Xerxes is like, all right, food, you know, this will work. Send for Haman immediately, and they're off to Esther's banquet. And they're having a grand time, eating, drinking, you know, catching up, because he doesn't get to see Esther very often, because there's a lot of other women in the picture, right? You can imagine he's having a good time, but it's eating at him. What, what could this possibly be for? Like, surely this new casserole that Esther wanted to try out the recipe for wasn't worth sticking her neck on the line, come before me. So eventually, the the curiosity eats him alive, and he says out loud in verse 6, tell me what you really want. What is your request? I'll give it to you. Again, even it's half the kingdom. Like, be assured, I'm on your side. But even in this, Esther plays coy. And we're left to wonder, like, is this careful seduction? Is she being a tease? Is she intentionally withholding to get him to be really, really interested? Or maybe she's just lacking the courage, even in this moment, to speak up. Like, you've been there, right? God's tapped you on the shoulder. i got to have this conversation with my spouse. I know I need to. I've needed to have it for a long time. And maybe you set it up, and you do a little dinner, or you take him out to eat. And then when the time comes, you're like, you guys want to go out again tomorrow night, right? Like, we'll just deal with this at another time. We don't know. 
again, painfully, we don't get insight into what she's thinking or even what the king is thinking. All we know is she puts it off for another night. This is her response to his question. This is my request, my deepest wish. If I have found favor with the king and if it pleases the, the king to grant my request and do whatever I ask, then please come with Haman tomorrow for a banquet I'll prepare for you. And then I'll explain what all of this is really about. You know that's eating him alive. King Xerxes is used to getting what he wants. He wants answers. And she is like, well, come again tomorrow. And that, that can cause you to sleep a little weird, you know? Like, what could all of this be for? You've probably been through this at some relationship in your life or some job. Like, the boss tells you on Friday, hey, Monday morning, come see me. And you're like, no! <laughs> like, can we meet before I go home for the weekend? I need to be able to sleep. Okay. We don't get to know what, es or what Xerxes really thinks. We don't get to know what Esther really thinks. But we do get profound insight into what one of the characters in the room thinks. His name is Haman. This is what the text says. Verse 9, it continues. It moves on to him, so we're going to move on to him. Haman was a happy man when he left the banquet. Imagine that, right? You're already moving up the ranks. You think the king is buddy-buddy with you. In fact, a lot of the people believe that his position would have been the position that actually extends the golden scepter. Like, he gets to decide whether or not people are even going to come before the king. He's got a lot of power, influence, pomp, circumstance. Like, he's the man. And this man just got invited, invited to a banquet with the king and the queen. Like, he's at their table. He's had a good day. <laughs> Happy as a man could possibly be, he left the banquet. But, there's always a but. Anybody know somebody who can never just have a good day? <laughs> but when he saw Mordecai sitting at the palace gate, not standing up or trembling nervously before him. Remember, previously he expected him to bow. Haman just loses his mind and becomes furious. He manages to restrain himself in person, but when he goes home, the, you know, the restraint comes off. You've been there. You've had a bad day. You've had a bad experience with somebody. You go home. You start just unloading on that person to your spouse or your kids or to all your friends. Here's what happens. Haman gathered together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and boasted to them about how great his wealth and his children were. He bragged about all the honors the king had given them and how he'd been promoted over all of the other nobles and the officials. Like, this is a Scrooge McDuck moment. Can you get all of my valuable things and put them in the living room so I can just boast in my goodness? <laughs> Look at all my kids, they're awesome because I'm awesome, right? Haman is feeling himself. At least he seems like somebody who has really low self-esteem who's trying to feel himself. I'm promoted over all the other nobles and officials, and that's not all, he adds. Queen Esther invited me and the king himself to a banquet she prepared for us, and she's invited me to dine again tomorrow. My life is awesome. <laughs> But then he added, there's always a but. Verse 13, this is all worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting there at the palace. Nothing's good enough if I'm not getting the respect that I think I deserve. Nothing's good enough if the person I don't like isn't getting their just desserts. Nothing's good enough for me. You ever been with somebody? Who's just, there's always another thing, always chasing the next high in whatever capacity that is. Nothing can ever be good enough. This is a huge lesson, by the way, a great biblical illustration in having your self esteem based on what God says you are rather than all the things that you need and what other people think about you. He literally has everything that a Persian could ask for. But this Mordecai guy is so up in his craw that he can't even sleep at night. Can't even go home and enjoy his, his wife and his kids. It's all got to be about Mordecai. Don't be that person. Surrender that to God because it doesn't end up well for Haman and it's not going to end up well for you. What should have happened in this moment as he professes all of this to his friends and family is they should have built up his self-esteem. They should have been like, look, man, you're awesome. You're a great dad. Like, his wife could have said, look, you don't have to sleep with Mordecai. Like, you sleep with me, okay? Listen to what I say about you. We like you. We're pleased. The king loves you. Like, you're the man. It, who cares what Mordecai thinks? 
That's what should have happened from supportive friends, supportive family. Like, dude, come on. You need your self-worth based on what we think about you. Not this random dude. Who cares? But that's not what happens. They feed into the frenzy. And this happens a lot in the scriptures, which tells me it happens a lot in real life. We're not super rational and cool-headed when people that we love feel threatened or hurt. We want to be on their side, even if it's not a good place to be. (laughs) Here's what they say. Verse 14. So Haman's wife, Zeresh, and her friends suggested, set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall. And in the morning, ask the king to have Mordecai impaled on it. How do you deal with people you don't like? (laughs) Kill them! And when it's done, you can go your merry way, as if. That's not how it works for people who base their self-esteem on other people. There's always another Mordecai. You can go on your merry way to the banquet with the king. That'll solve all your problems. And what does is, what is this suggest, suggestion feel like for Haman? Well, text says, this pleased Haman. Doesn't please God. But we're not concerned about God in the book of Esther. We're concerned about me, my feelings, my desires, whether they're holy or not. This pleased Haman, so he ordered the pole get set up. Now, do you guys remember the line that I introduced last week quickly in passing that I said was going to matter this week? It's this. God's favor doesn't have an expiration date. If you'll remember, the beginning of chapter 2, Mordecai fails a plot for assassins to try to kill King Xerxes. And he doesn't get any kind of reward, pomp and circumstance, or anything in that moment. But favor doesn't expire with God. So Xerxes is already probably having a hard time sleeping because of what Esther is withholding from him. But now we also know that God is in the midst of this. So it should be no surprise that Esther chapter 6 opens like this. That night, the king had trouble sleeping. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. But listen to this. So he ordered an attendant to bring the book of the history of his reign so that it could be read to him. How many of you need to fall back to sleep by somebody, you know, reading all of your accomplishments to you? (laughs) Might be a little narcissistic. I'm not sure. Not a psychologist. But as this happened, this is God, right? So it could be read to him. In those records, he discovered an account of how Mordecai had exposed an assassination plot. And and this is his question. What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? And his attendants replied, nothing. Nothing was done for him. So the king's like, well, that can't happen. Now that it's been brought back to my attention, I'm sorry. Let's make this happen. So he says, who's in the outer court? Who could I talk to about this? And it happened that Haman had just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to impale Mordecai on the pole that he had prepared. God had a different plan. So the attendants replied to the king, Haman's out in the court. Well, bring him in. Haman and king are buddy-buddy. So Haman came in, and the king said this, what should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? Now, if you're in Haman's shoes, who do you think he's talking about? I just sat with the king and queen last night, and it's going to be happening again today. Maybe this is all about me. (laughs) It's like your boss calling you into into work, and she says, you know, hey, what would a certain junior partner, wink, wink, be interested in having in terms of office furniture if they get promoted into a quarter office? And you're like, oh, man, promotion's coming. Why would your boss ever talk to you like that if it wasn't for you? And so you describe your dream office only to see Monday morning Mark's name on it (laughs) instead of yours. This is what happens with Haman. He says, Who would the king wish to honor more than me? And so he displays this elaborate day, the best day that he could think of, where he just, everyone gives him the honor and respect that Mordecai withholds perpetually. This is what you should do. You can read the whole thing. I'm skipping it here because it's long. Just have this amazing day. And the king says, excellent, quick, take the robes, the horse, all the stuff that you asked for and do it. For Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the gate of the palace, leave nothing out that you suggested. And you've got to imagine, he's like, what? (laughs) No! How How could this be happening to me? He sets up his dream day. And his dream day goes to the dude that he wants dead. 
He showed up for Mordecai to be humiliated. What ends up happening? He gets humiliated. So Mordecai goes out. All this stuff happens. It's an awesome day for him. But Mordecai goes home, or sorry, Haman goes home from the Mordecai parade, dejected, verse 12, and completely humiliated. This was not a good day for Haman. And then there's an interesting line thrown in that I'm not going to speculate too much on because I think there's so many verses that you could speculate on in the book of Esther. But it's worth ruminating or just allowing it to sit for a second. Listen to the change of tone of Haman's family and friends. Just earlier this day, they were saying, we got to kill this guy. Get him out of the picture. This is what they say now. Verse 13. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and his friends what had happened, his wise advisors <laughs> and his wife said, since Mordecai, this man who has humiliated you is of Jewish birth, you'll never succeed in your plans against him. It will be fatal to continue opposing him. Where does that come from? What, like, what's up with that change of tone? Are these the same people that we were talking to earlier today? Let me tell you, God's favor in your life can be evident to other people. They were like, shoot, we've messed with the wrong guy. <laughs> we got this one wrong. Unfortunately, we don't oftentimes you know, take wise advice. It's interesting how they're described as wise in this passage, not one a few verses earlier. <laughs> it would be wise to stop opposing him. It could be fatal. The next part needs to be read in full. This is how it continues. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. Esther did, or Haman didn't have long to wallow in his pity. He's got places to be. He's got to put on that, that tux and have somebody adjust the bow tie. Okay? He went to the Esther's banquet. On the second occasion while they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther, again, tell me what you want. I've waited long enough. What's your request? I'll give it to you. Same promise. Even if it's half the kingdom, like there's nothing you could ask for that I'm not willing to provide. So here it comes. All the gumption, all the intestinal fortitude, all the strength she has comes out in this moment as she blurts this out. If I've found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people be spared. I'm sure he was like, whoa. For my people have, have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had just merely been sold as slaves, I could have remained quiet. It would be too trivial for the king. And his response, the king, who would do such a thing? Like, I haven't heard anything about this. What are you talking about that your life is threatened? Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? You're the queen. You're under my protection. Ain't nobody messing with you. And you could imagine this moment, Haman choking on his soup, like... <coughs> This is not the dinner that he was expecting. Haman has had a bad day. He's taken one down. He sang a sad song, right? It just, it just keeps getting worse. Because he had no idea that Esther was a Jew either. And you can just imagine his head spinning in this moment. How could this be happening to me? Continues. So Esther replied and points right at him. This wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. And Haman grew pale, I imagine so, with fright before the king and the queen. And then the king jumps to his feet in rage and storms out to the palace garden. Let me tell you something. In Persian law, no man other than a eunuch was supposed to be alone with a female concubine or queen of the kings. In Persian culture, when the king stormed out, Haman should have excused himself as well. But he adds to the insult of the moment by staying behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew the king intended to kill him. In despair, he fell down on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining just as the king returned from the palace garden. You know, he's humbling himself before her. Save me! But no one's allowed to be alone with the queen. Ain't nobody allowed to touch her. And she's just said that he's trying to kill her, so the king walks in and's like, What's happening? Will you assault the queen right here in my palace before my eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, his attendants covered Haman's face, which means... <laughs> Signaling his doom. 
then Arbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said, Haman, you know, he set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to impale Mordecai, the guy that the king has just celebrated, the man who saved the king from assassination. What's King Xerxes' response? Impale Haman on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole that he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. Bad day for Haman. You ever had a bad day? Was it that bad? (laughs) You know, when I read this story, I couldn't help but see a New Testament parallel. Maybe you're sensing it too. Maybe you're even drawn to the exact same moment that I am. There's an opening scene of Jesus' ministry that's described in a number of Gospels, but there's one account in Matthew chapter 4 that I want to bring you to. It's the wilderness confrontation with the devil. Remember this? Where he goes in the wilderness to be tested for 40 days, and we have a specific you know, group of them that are outlined for us. Turn you know, rock into bread, all that stuff. Listen to this one. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. He says, I'll give it all to you if you'll just kneel down and worship me if you'll bow. Jesus' response, get out of here, Satan, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and only serve him. And the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. All Satan wanted was for Jesus to bow. Simple request. Show me the reverence and respect that I'm due. Like, I'm in charge of this place, you know? Why why can't we just embrace this simple little gesture? And when things don't go his way, when he doesn't get the respect that he deserves, he sets up a little plot of his own. But this time, it's not a 75-foot pole. It's a cross on a hill. But there's the same sort of justice and twist at the end. But listen to the similarities. Haman tries to kill all the Jews with a bribe of silver. Judas betrays Jesus with a bag of silver. Jesus also has a dinner with his insiders before this is supposed to happen. But in that moment, rather than get up and foil the plot, he allows Judas to leave and do what he's supposed to do. He doesn't say, we got to stop this guy right now. Jump him. Somebody get Judas. You have any idea what he's planning? How he's going to hurt me and hurt you? He doesn't do that. Like a lamb silent before the slaughter, he stood. Instead of saying, get Judas, he says, this is my blood poured out for you. And my body broken for you. Because there was a bigger thing than just Jesus saving himself or just Esther and Mordecai figuring out how they or their people could be saved. God has a plan for the salvation of the entire world unfolding in Jesus' story here. And Jesus, rather than foiling a plot and having somebody else pay for it, he's going to offer himself up as the perfect payment. But could you imagine the delight on Satan's face when this has happened? Right? Haman hates Mordecai so much, he never gets to see him in pain. He just sees him celebrated. But Satan gets to see Jesus getting whipped. In fact, you, you might remember, if you've seen it, the scene from The Passion of the Christ, where they depict Satan just kind of like standing silent with a smirk as Jesus' flesh is being whipped off or ripped off by the cat of nine tails, right? You can imagine him gleeful as, as the, the crown of thorns goes down and his people are spitting on him and yelling these false accusations at him. And when he's ultimately nailed up on the cross and he's about to take his last breath, Satan just like, ah, would have been pretty easy. All you had to do was bow. But just like in the Mordecai Haman story, God has a great reversal in store for what's about to happen here. Ultimately, just like the pole, the cross is going to be the very instrument of Satan's defeat. He sets it up for Jesus to end him. What happens is it ends the power that Satan has on your life and mine. Because the only power that he has is accusations. That's literally what hasatan, the Greek word, the name for Satan or the devil in the scriptures means, the accuser. He spends all of his time and energy accusing you. But you know what Jesus did? 
when he received all of the accusations that weren't true, when an innocent man stood, and there is no other innocent person but Jesus, and received all that pain, that guilt, that shame, that burden, and that death, he disarmed all of Satan's accusations. Because if you are in Jesus, you are washed clean by his blood, and none of those accusations stick to you because they mean nothing. Your past is gone. It's as far as the east is from the west. None of the stuff that held you back before, if you are in Christ, is now something that G- or Satan can hold against you. In that moment, the very thing that Satan thought was going to destroy the Son of God became your greatest liberation when the Son of God defeated sin and death and the devil. And did you know that Satan or Jesus isn't still dead? He's alive. His Caesar knew every morning. And he didn't just kind of like go away into obscurity. He was ascended into heaven, sitting at God's right hand, still advocating for you. What's true 2,000 years ago is true today, that you can be made clean and whole, declared righteous, so that Satan has no power over you because of the blood of the Lamb. Every accusation that Satan can throw at you is absorbed by Jesus. And he was happy to do it. Did you know that the book of Esther ends in a similar way to that Christ narrative where Jesus is ascended on high and put at the right hand of God with all the power and the influence and the ability to advocate for you? It's kind of trippy. Look at it. Esther chapter 10. This is how it goes. King Xerxes imposed a tribute throughout the empire, even to the distant coastlands. His achievements, great achievements, and the full account of the greatness of who? Mordecai whom the king had promoted are recorded in the book of history of the kings of Media and Persia. Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister with authority next to King Xerxes himself. He was very great among the Jews who held him in in high self-esteem, or held, not high self-esteem, high esteem, because he continued to work for the good of the people and speak up for their welfare and all of their descendants. Why? God's favor doesn't have an expiration date. In fact, it gets better with age. (laughs) Do you know that Jesus is still doing the same thing for you? That Mordecai was doing for the Jews, advocating for you, standing up on your behalf, making a way for you, working all things out for the good of your purpose as God has called you for uniquely? I want to remind you, though, that the story doesn't end here. Haman is slain, but Esther and Mordecai still have to figure out this big problem, the threat to the Jews. It's not just one moment and it's all over. Haman doesn't die and then everybody's okay because Persian law can't be rewritten. Even a king and King Xerxes in this passage reminds Esther and Mordecai, look, even the power of the king isn't great enough to revoke a law. Here's what he says. I gotta find it in here. Verse eight of chapter eight. Go ahead and send a message to the Jews in the king's name. This, by the way, is the same freedom he gives Haman a few chapters earlier. Go ahead and send a message to the Jews in the king's name, telling them whatever you want. Seal it with the king's signet ring. But remember, whatever has already been written in the king's name and sealed with his signet ring can never be revoked. So Mordecai and Esther are forced to come up with another way to protect the Jews. They just can't say, cancel the order. (laughs) It's not the way Persian law worked. So they opt to send out a different decree, allowing all of the Jews in all of the cities and all of the provinces to unite to form militias to defend themselves. It's not just Persian against an individual Jew. It's anybody who hates Jews against all the Jews united with God behind them. And it doesn't just say defend yourself. It says go ahead and go on the offensive. Kill in advance the people who you think are going to kill you. This is a really crazy story. In fact, it's literally eliminating all of the spiritual Amalekites that we talked about a couple messages before. Here's the new decree that goes out. Verse 16. The Jews were filled with great joy and gladness and honored everywhere. In every province and city where the king's decrees arrived, the Jews rejoiced with great celebration and declared a public festival and holiday. And many of the people in the land even became Jews themselves. Why? They feared what the Jews might do to them. (laughs) And throughout all of the empire, on the days that this was allowed, the Jews killed 75,000 people. In the city of Susa itself, where Xerxes was, where this whole story is unfolding, uh, 800 people are killed by the Jews, including 10 of Haman's sons who join him on poles. And that might be disturbing for you. It's a little unsettling for me. 
Like, that doesn't seem like the godly way, right? <laughs> like, why would the story end like that? Why did everybody have to die? There had to have been a different way. Well, we've been told by Xerxes that the, com the commandment and the condemning order can't just be revoked. Somebody was going to have to die through this. Now, I want you to think about this theologically. And I'm going to read you a little tiny excerpt from a commentary on the book of Esther. Here's what it says. Just as Xerxes, king of Persia, could not simply rescind the first decree of death, God, king of the universe, cannot simply rescind the decree of death pronounced in the Garden of Eden against humanity. Instead, he issues a counter decree of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because God did not simply rescind the curse of death on humanity, his counter decree of redemption necessarily resulted in the incarnation of his son and in that son's death on the cross. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And unlike in Esther's story, we're not allow, God's not allowing everybody else to pay for our sin. It doesn't trickle down on our family and our friends and anybody else in our, in our province. God is going to drink that cup whole himself on the cross. By the way, just to get this right, the 75,000 people who were killed in this moment, you recognize that us as spiritual adulterers, haters of God, which the scriptures talk about, those who aren't in Christ, that we would be a part of those enemies? <laughs> what does God do? Rather than slay us, give us the death that we deserve, to squish us like the little bugs we seem to be, he comes himself and bears it all on the cross. The pole, the tree set up, cursed is anyone who goes on the tree. He takes our curse for us and flips Satan's scheme on its head. The thing that was supposed to be the end of the Son of God's story is the beginning of yours. <laughs> Paul says this really succinctly, by the way, in Colossians. It's not just me waxing eloquently up here. He says this in chapter 2. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature not having yet been cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly, just like Haman, <laughs> by his victory over them on the cross. Rather than you or I or any of our kin suffering our own fate, God took it on himself in Jesus. In Esther's story, this was such an amazing feat that the Jews, by Mordecai's decree, make this a, a national festival. Every year, they're going to remember this. They call the festival Purim, which means the casting of lots. Why? Because Haman decided what day all the Jews were going to die by casting lots. It's irony. The Jewish story loves irony because God always shows up even when it seems like he's not going to. And so they celebrate this every single year, that God, through the wicked schemes of man, brought about deliverance for his people, the good of his people. Did you know that Christians have an equivalent day to Purim, the festival in the Old Testament? You know what it's called? It's a day full of irony. Good Friday. The day where, this, where God died, the darkest day in history, is the best day we could ever imagine. Because it's the day God died for you and for me to set us free. Without this day, we would have no good days. But instead, he trades our sinful rags for his glorious riches and inheritance. There's still a war raging out there. Don't be deceived. Like God has disarmed the powers and the authorities, but they're still acting like they're in charge. And I tend to think the theological equivalent of the Jewish militia of Esther's day is the church of Jesus Christ. We take ground. We don't just defend ourselves. We take ground. Now, we don't take ground with swords. We don't just try to kill anybody who disagrees with us. We don't just, you know, slaughter anybody that we've had a problem with in our past. That's not how it works. We fight with different cause and different purpose. Of course, there have been times, dark days in Christian history where the church has done just that, slaughtered people, kill people it didn't agree with to try to have its own power. But we don't fight like that. We fight through proclaiming the victory of Jesus Christ. Paul is so clear on this. Our weapon is the word of God, the truth of our testimony, the blood of the lamb. That is the power that we have to fight with. It's our call and our commission to put on the full armor of God and go into the world to do what? Make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all the things that Christ commanded. So let me ask you a question. What's your role in the battle? Like, are you a part of it? (laughs) Are you sitting on the sidelines? If God could use Mordecai and Esther, compromised people, to bring about the deliverance of absolutely everybody in the nation, and you have trusted in Jesus Christ, have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, empowered by the indwelling presence of His Spirit, what couldn't you do? What ground couldn't you take for the kingdom's cause? See, God's always working behind the scenes. He knows your failures. He knows your sins. He knows all the ways that you've compromised to get to where you are. He knows right now your insecurity and your problem and your struggle. And yet, he has made a way for you to come back to him, for your story to be reclaimed by his purpose, for you to have power in this world, not to just defend yourself and have a grand old time, but to actually be used for his grand purpose to save the world. He made a way. You know what the way his name is? J-E-S-U-S. No one's bigger from the East. I couldn't, I couldn't help it. <laughs> it's programmed in, in Bible school. His name is Jesus. If you're willing to confess your sins and return to him, he is willing to exchange beauty for ashes. He is willing to flip the script on all the ways that the enemy and sin of your making and other people's making has set up your cross and exchange it for the one that Jesus has already died on so that you could be the righteousness of God Have a plan and a purpose in his kingdom. You don't have to pass down your junk to another generation. You don't have to keep hurting your family and your friends. It doesn't have to keep affecting your life day after day because in Jesus, your past can be erased and your story can be rewritten. Allow Jesus' blood to write a new commandment in the kingdom that reverses your fate. Who knows? That's the theme of the book of Esther. Who knows? Maybe, just maybe, you are where you are right now today at this part of your life, at this part in your story, for God to use you powerfully and mightily. But we've learned, it's the theme of our church here, that he is the vine, we are the branches, and if we aren't attached to him, we will accomplish nothing. If we are in him, we will produce much fruit. So who knows? Maybe you were are where you are for such a time as this. Maybe if you're willing to step into the light and receive God's favor that just gets better with age, that he will change your life. Today, we really could stand up like Mordecai and even other faith giants like Joseph and Jesus to proclaim this story. It's the story of the ages. It's the story of Esther. It's the story of the scriptures as a whole. It's your story. This is Genesis chapter 50, just to throw it somewhere else. You intended to harm me. But God intended it for what? No, 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 that wasn't, no one, that wasn't good. <laughs> you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for? Good. Yeah. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. What might God be writing your story for? I'm afraid to guess because my guess would be too small.